So one of the most worrying scenario for the parents of a newborn is when they come to know that they can't make it whether their newborn is a male or a female. Now although in many parts of the world such a condition is immediately brought into the notice of the clinicians, but then in certain parts of the world this might be associated with stigmatization, so it might not be brought into the clinical notice because of the shame associated with it, which can sometimes lead to serious consequences. So in this particular lecture, we will be taking a clinical approach to a child who has got ambiguous genitalia, something that falls within the domain of disorders of factual differentiation. So here I am, Dr. Sayed Kazmi, and if you are ready to know more about this condition, so then let's dive in and get started. Okay, fellow. So the first thing that we I want to discuss uh, you know, with respect to approach to ambiguous genitalia is how the genitalia develops. So, so a little bit about the embryology of the genital system. Now the genital system is mesodermal in origin. So the paraiotic uh, mesoderm it actually descends down and then uh, makes the undifferentiated gonads. So then the undifferentiated gonads in case of males, if the uh, genotype is XY, then under the influence of the genes which are formed by the Y part of the um, chromosomes, they cause uh, the fetal uh, genital cells to uh, secrete testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. And I will be using the word DHT for dihydrotestosterone um, in this particular lecture. So testosterone is converted by 5-alpha reductase into dihydrotestosterone and this, di five dihyd as this dihydrotestosterone is then acts on the peripheral tissue, especially the external gonads and causes them to take the male phenotype. So remember, for in males, for external genitalia to take the male shape, body needs testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. These two things are very important. In case of females, the relative absence of these two hormones, that is testosterone and DHT, what happens? Because of the relatively deficiency of these two hormones, the external genitalia would take the phenotype of the female. So you should keep this thing in your mind that for genitalia to take the male shape, two hormones need to be present. Testosterone and then its conversion to the active form by 5-alpha reductase enzyme into dihydrotestosterone. While the relative deficiency of these two would lead uh, the, uh, to development of female phenotype. Now this is irrespective of whether the uh, genotype is XY or XX, as you will see later in, the, uh, in this lecture. <coughs> so if in an XY there is proper testosterone and its conversion into dihydrotestosterone, then what we will see is that eventually the male develops this type of external genitalia, which is known as the male proper male pattern. While in the, in the, in the um, absence of these two uh, hormones, the female uh, sort of uh, you know, phenotype of external genitalia develops. Now in between, you can have different combinations in which uh, the genitalia partly resembles the male and partly resembles the female phenotype and we call it ambiguous genitalia and to make it very simple remember in males if the genotype is xy any factor any factor in the body that leads to decrease a decrease in the hormone testosterone and dihydrotestosterone that would cause ambiguous genitalia because it would not be proper male phenotype it would be some characteristic of male and some characteristic of female and we call it ambiguous genitalia while in females it would be the opposite so in female if there is relatively increase in testosterone or its active form dihydrotestosterone then what would happen there would be a bit of fusion of the uh, external gonads and that would cause some form of ambiguity in the uh, external genitalia again which would call ambiguous genitalia so to cut it short Remember, irrespective of whether the genotype is XY or XX, it is these two hormones, testosterone and dihydrotestosterone, which actually forms the external genitalia in its, in its male phenotype. While the relative absence of these two enzymes would cause the genitalia to develop into the 
female phenotype and again if this balance is disturbed like in males if there is relatively deficiency of these two hormones the external genitalia would be ambiguous similarly in female fetuses or if there is relatively increase in testosterone and uh, dihydrotestosterone then the external genitalia would be ambiguous again because there will be some characteristics of male genitalia and some characteristics of female genitalia so having said that let's move on and discuss the nomenclature now the nomenclature has changed in the previous text there were certain terms that were used for uh, this ambiguous genitalia uh, the word intersex was used uh, which is now uh, known as disorders of sexual differentiation so we no more call it intersex disorders we call it disorders of sexual differentiation similarly uh, the previous term was male pseudo hermaphrodite if the genotype was xy but the phenotype was ambiguous and looked like a female so we used to call it male pseudo hermaphrodite now we call it 46 xy disorder of sexual uh, differentiation similarly the female pseudo hermaphrodite where the uh, genotype was XX but the uh, phenotype was of male uh, or ambiguous uh, now it is known as 46 XX disorder of sexual uh, differentiation where we used to call them true hermaphrodite where some form of ovaries and a part of testes both are present now it is known as ovo testicular uh, disorder of sexual differentiation so ovo testicular means that both ovaries and some part of testes are also present and uh, we used to uh, use a, a term which was known as xx male or xxx reversal either for males or females uh, now we call it 46 xx testicular disorder of sexual differentiation or 46 xy complete gonadal uh, dysgenesis so simply mean it's a male with xy but there's complete gonadal dysgenesis that that's why the genitalia is ambiguous and similarly in a case of female it is 46 xx but then uh, that feet has got some uh, uh, element of testicular tissue inside so that would be known as 46 xx disorder of sexual differentiation so the main word is disorders of sexual differentiation we don't call it intersex disorders because um that doesn't look that doesn't sound nice so we now call it disorder of sexual differentiation now moving onward how do we approach a child who's got ambiguous genitalia now ambiguous genitalia most of the times are probably 95 to 98 percent of the times would present in the newborn period so obviously parents uh, and in certain cultures as soon as the when the baby is born so his genitalia are checked because in certain societies uh, for different reasons um, males are given more preference and um, obviously more happiness um, is shown on the birth of uh, male uh, children so that's why usually uh, the genitalia are checked so if the genitalia is ambiguous then there would be certain questions some people say is my child uh, a eunuch some would say well uh, is it a boy is it a girl so different questions are arise and it leads to a lot of parental anxiety so most of the times these babies who have got ambiguous genitalia would be presenting in the newborn period but sometimes in certain uh, conditions like where there might be some uh, chromosomal disorders like uh, klein filter syndrome some other syndrome they might present late as well like later in the childhood or even in uh, early adolescence so uh, most of the time for practical reasons uh, you would be seeing them in the newborn period so whenever a child presents with um, ambiguous genitalia he's got like either uh, incomplete fusion of uh, labiosacral swelling or there is you seems like there is clitoromegaly or there is a shaft uh, so there's a, there is a small phallus um, with bifid scrotum so again it can be different like different 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 patterns can can can, can be there but the first thing is you always take a history a thorough history and physical examination you ask whether the uh, pregnancy was uh, um, was going normally did the mom take any sort of uh, hormonal treatment during the pregnancy you always ask about the different types of drugs that she might have taken uh, you also ask about the whether there have been previous um, children born with the same issue and uh, again then you also uh, take uh, uh, you know sort of family history about these things and so on and so forth and then you do a complete examination of the child as well to see if there are other features as well are there any dysmorphic features are there other like congenital defects again you have to do your complete history and physical examination in order to uh, properly reach at the causes so once you have done that 
The next question is because most of the parents, usually the first thing they ask is uh, to the doctors whether this is a male or a female. So remember, never, never assign the sex. So the most important thing is never assign the sex. This is the most important. Tell them that it would need further investigations. And it's a very complex question because it might uh, even be related to how the way the child is brought up later. Uh, what are the underlying abnormalities? What are the social cultural beliefs of the family? So it's a very complex question. So the first thing that you would do is the local examination. So when you do the local examination, what you are looking for, you are looking at the labioscrotal swelling uh, or labioscrotal folds for presence of any gonads. So you would do an examination to see if there are any sort of palpable gonads, one or two, in the labioscrotal swelling so this is the first thing that specific thing that uh, you do in the examination when you are properly uh, clinically approaching a child with ambiguous genitalia obviously you would do a few things at the same time you would take bloods because a child who presents with ambiguous genitalia it's very important that you uh, do the screening for 17 hydroxy progesterone uh, because congenital adrenal hyperplasia is one of the common causes of ambiguous genitalia and the other thing is you would also uh, want to know the karyo uh, type. So you need to know what is the chromosomal uh, pattern of the fetus. So whether it's an XX, XY, XO, XXY or mosaicism like some XX, some XY. So again, you need to have proper karyotyping or microarray for that. So again, the blood has to be taken for that. So blood is basically taken for karyotyping and uh, screening for 17 hydroxy progesterone and then it is followed by ultrasound because uh, you have to see if there is like um, intra-abdominal presence of the gonads like testes or uh, uterus so if you find uh, that there are palpable gonads both uh, gonads are palpable in the uh, labio uh, scrotal swelling then obviously these are testes and uh, you have then to determine uh, what is the reason that uh, the, the child has got in because genitalia. But if you find that the labioscrotal folds are empty, now you don't know whether now the intra-abdominal organ are somewhere down the line, whether this baby has got uh, testes or got ovaries. So once you uh, find out that there are no palpable gonads, then you need to do an ultrasound. Because the ultrasound would tell you whether the uterus is present or not. So if the uterus is present, then obviously by that time you have taken the blood for 17 hydroxy progesterone because uterus is present, probably you are dealing with a female child. So if the 17 hydroxy progesterone is elevated, and obviously, in the meantime, the uh, karyotyping comes out to be XX, that is the uh, female genotype, then you are probably dealing either with congenital adrenal hyperplasia. But if it is normal, then in case of XX, you might be dealing with exogenous um, over uh, production, over use of um, uh, male hormones, which the mother might have taken because of different reasons. Uh, the other thing, if the uterus is present and the uh, screening test for 17 hydroxy progesterone is normal and the uh, karyotyping shows that it's a mix, it is either a few cells are XX and few are XY, that is what we call as male female mosaicism, or some of the cells are simple X with XY, or it's a male, let's say, with uterus present. So it could be either a conidal dysgenesis where the gonads have not uh, properly developed at all the male gonads have not developed or it might be uh, what we call as a over testicular disorder of sexual differentiation but in this case remember at least one one because over testicular means that it's sort of a bisexual thing so part of the uh, the ovaries or female genital uh, reproductive system is present and part of the male is also present. So at least then one gonad would be palpable. At least one testes would be palpable in either the left or the right labioscrotal field. So this is important. But if both are absent, then either both testes would be there inside the abdomen. If the uterus is absent, we call it uh, like 46XY disorder of sexual differentiation with intra-abdominal gonads. It simply means that the testes have not uh, descended down 
they are there in the abdomen but obviously and the karyotype is xy so this is basically a male child because he hasn't got any uh, uterus uh, the chromosomal pattern is xy but he's got ambiguous genitalia because the testes could not descend down and there was some problem with the hormone production and hormone conversion in the uh, intrauterine fetal life so it could be because of uh, well uh, deficiency of the 5 alpha reductase uh, that converts the uh, testosterone to uh, 5 uh, sorry to testosterone to dihydrotestosterone so that is the active form so if that is not like acting on its receptors obviously the testes wouldn't go down the external genitalia would not be properly developed and the male child would have a ambiguous genitalia so in case of male it becomes very easy but as i told you if uterus is present and the phenotype is female then it is either congenital adrenal hyperplasia of the 17 hydroxy progesterone is elevated but if it is normal then it could be one of the possibility could be uh, excessive uh, androgen use by the mom or if the karyotype is mixed then you are probably looking at over testicular uh, syndromes in other words we also call it like the previous terminology was uh, hermaphrodite as well and uh, they've got some parts of the female reproductive system and some parts of the male reproductive system because again some of the cells uh, have got xx pattern some of them have got xy pattern or some of them have got simple x with no other x so again it's it's a very complex sort of a uh, thing where some cells we call it simply this the 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 general word used for that is chromosomal mosaicism so some cells would be xx some cells will be xy but it's quite rare in in, in practice uh, moving on if uh, let's say one of the uh, gonads is palpable at least one so the left or the right in the previous slide we talked about when both folds were empty but let's say one fold shows something now it becomes more tricky because it could be one testes which has descended the other one hasn't descended might be in case of males or it might be a female where um, you know she might have like ovaries and part of the testes again you know pro, pro, what we call is over testicular disorder sexual differentiation so again the thing is that the approach is the same by the time we have we are doing this examination we take blood for seven hydroxy progesterone and at the same time we have taken blood to do the karyotyping and we do the ultrasound we do not assign the sex of the child we do an ultrasound to see if the uterus is present or not so let's say if the uterus is present and the karyotype comes out to be a male or a mosaicism with some chromosomes are x and some are xy so we call it as gonadal dysgenesis where again it's a sort of a child who has got some cells of male some cells of female and uh, he has got uterus present but his chromosomal pattern is xy so for some reason the, there has been complete gonadal dysgenesis and the undifferentiated gonads have not properly developed into the male pattern and uh, oh, it's a part of like the over testicular uh, disorder of sexual differentiation now if the karyotype is xx or is again is a mosaicism so again over testicular disorder of sexual differentiation because she's a female she's got uterus present but at the same time if there is one palpable gonad so the one palpable gonad obviously something which would be the labioscrotal swelling it could not be ovary it would be testy so this has got uterus present as well as got um, testes present so it's an over testicular disorder of sexual differentiation if the uterus is absent one uh, palpable gonad is there that is probably one testes and the karyotype is male then obviously it simply means that one testes has descended down the other testes hasn't descended and probably somewhere in the inguinal canal or probably in the intra uh, abdominal area so we need to do some further tests so we would do the baseline luteinizing hormone follicle stimulating hormone uh, and the uh, beta uh, sorry the hum uh, human coronic gonadotropin stimulation uh, test so and then we find out that whether it leads to elevation in the testosterone level or not so we give the hcg stimulation and we see if there is low production of testosterone even after given hcg then it's probably a biosynthetic defect we also call it gonadal dysgenesis it simply means that uh, uh, somehow uh, the testosterone is not developing at all there is some form of enzymatic deficiency so that uh, there is almost like complete deficiency of testosterone or very low levels of testosterone so there is some form of gonadal dysgenesis due to enzymatic deficiency if there is high testosterone 
after the HCG stimulation test, but low dihydrotestosterone. It simply means that the conversion is defective because uh, you know when you are giving HCG, it's leading to elevated testosterone, but then its conversion to the active form is decreased. Because if this is increased, this should also increase. So the enzyme here, which converts the uh, the uh, testosterone into dihydrotestosterone, that enzyme is 5-alpha reductase. That enzyme is missing. So if that enzyme is missing, you've got a high testosterone but low. And I told you this is the hormone that is responsible for converting the genitalia into the male pattern. So if that is low, obviously, even if the child is a male XY, he would be having ambiguous genitalia. But if you get a high testosterone and a high dihydrotestosterone, now the question is, you have given HCG, testosterone increased, and dihydrotestosterone also increased. It means 5-alpha reductase enzyme is working, but then still, it is not you know, affecting on its receptor. So the problem is in the receptor. Problem is in androgen receptor on the target cell. The problem is in androgen receptors on target cells, which would be the testes and the uh, external gonads. We call it androgen insensitivity syndrome. It's also known as testicular feminization syndrome. It's also known as androgen insensitivity syndrome so basically these are genotypically males but their phenotype would be of females so usually these types of uh, genetically males are brought up as females because you can't do anything about it testosterone is there five hydro uh, sorry dihydrotestosterone is there but the receptor is not working you can't do anything with the receptor so the best approach in this case would be to uh, bring them up as females and once they reach um, the uh, puberty or even before that then the the thing is that the testes have to be removed because there might be a chance of malignant transformation so some form of uh, uh, sex change surgery might have to be done later on but most of the time these uh, kids are brought up as females you might have like you know heard in the newspapers that um, somebody underwent an operation and became a complete girl so usually probably they were like uh, having androgen insensitivity syndrome so this is how you approach a child with ambiguous genitalia so again i told you to cut it down uh, make it simplified remember when it's ambiguous genitalia you do not assign the sex of the child you would do an examination to see if the the, the um, uh, gonads are palpable in the labioscrotal folds or not so if they are completely absent there is one way of dealing with that if one is present and well, they're absent again uh, the approach is a similar but the differential diagnosis is uh, is changed so what you do is after doing your examination you would be taking bloods for karyotyping and uh, screening for 17 uh, uh, hydroxyprogesterone and uh, you would be uh, doing an ultrasound to see if there is presence of uterus or not and by the time you have done the ultrasound and the results of the karyotyping are available and then you might have to do a few further tests like if it's if you think it's congenital adrenal hyperplasia i will discuss that in a moment uh, but if uh, it is the other forms like the over testicular disorders of sexual differentiation or androgen insensitivity syndrome or 5 alpha reductase uh, deficiency then you have to sit down with the parents explain to them about the complexity of these issues and tell them that it is very difficult to label it again it depends now on the parents whether they want to rear that child or bring up that child as a male or a female depending on their socio-cultural beliefs uh, depending on their own choices and maybe later on uh, the child as he grows up has to be taken into confidence what the child wants to be it's a very complex thing and uh, would be dealt later on uh, moving on there are a few syndromes as well like sometimes you might find a child with ambiguous genitalia who has also got dysmorphic uh, features so some of the dysmorphic features along with the ambiguous genitalia would uh, guide you to the uh, syndromes that might be responsible for um, 
these things. And the ones that, uh, there are many, but the ones that need worth mentioning is smith lemley opitz syndrome. So in these case, the kids have got microcephaly, so they've got a small uh, skull. They have are mentally retarded, so they have got like um, intellectually, uh, they are chilly. They have got cardiac defects. They might have ptosis. They might have an upturned nose. Uh, they have got a small mouth, uh, micrognathia, they might have cl a cleft palate, they might have like uh, multiple fingers, polydactyly, and they might have like uh, syndactyly of stores as well. Uh, they might have severe hypospadias where the urethra is like opening on the ventral surface of the uh, penis. They might have micropenis and they later on might have growth failure. So they, it's like it's syndrome. It's got so many things, mostly microcephaly, cardiac defects, um, particular faces up to nose. That is Smith uh of uh, lemley opit syndrome you can have it in Weger syndrome which stands for wilms tumor niridia cataracts genitor genitourinary abnormalities with mental retardation so again it, this is again a sort of a syndrome with the uh, complex uh, multi-system deformities or again another one is charge in which you have got the coloboma of the iris heart defects coenal atresia uh, retarded to growth again genital hypoplasia it could be part of the robinov syndrome where they got flat faces hypertelorism they've got like thoracic hemivertebrae it could be with the part of the exlic license the license carefully where like the brain uh, cortex is not properly developed and it could be part of the trisomy 13 or petau syndrome which leads uh, which is usually presents with the hollow uh prostate carefully polydactyly um cleft palate hypospadias and cryptorchidism but in all these cases there is dysmorphism the child doesn't look normal uh, he might have mental retardation he might have like multi organ defects and again like uh, that requires like complex testing but uh, simply remember that some of the uh, syndromes might be responsible for ambiguous genitalia as well so it not only be like the xy or the xx chromosome problems or simply the problems of um, of, of hormones as I told you, that uh, relatively uh, increase of testosterone and uh, dihydrotestosterone in females or the deficiency of that in males is going to lead to ambiguity. One thing that needs worth mentioning uh, is uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And congenital adrenal hyperplasia, usually uh, girls who have got congenital adrenal hyperplasia, they would uh, be born with the uh, ambiguous genitalia so usually we do the 17 hydroxy progesterone which is a good uh, screening test for uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia and if that is raised the child has got some form of congenital adrenal hyperplasia now congenital adrenal hyperplasia is basically a hyperplasia enlargement of the adrenal gland secreting a lot of hormones and again there are enzymatic defects so the common enzymatic deficiencies in a congenital adrenal hyperplasia are 21 hydroxylase deficiency 17 hydroxylase deficiency and 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency so remember these are the three enzymes which are responsible for different types of congenital adrenal hyperplasia what happens remember congenital adrenal hyperplasia it's very easy to clinical differentiate between the two because you would be looking for signs of uh, hyper aldosteronism in the form of uh, or decrease in in the form of uh, salt retention or salt losing and the other thing would be increase in virilization because of the relative increase or deficiency of uh, testosterone so i will write the words a or aldosterone and t for testosterone so it's very easy if you see this 21 so if i just write 21 so if you remember A for aldosterone and T for testosterone and you write 21 here, 21 hydroxylase. If for 17, I write 1 and 7 and for 11, I write 1 and 1. So just put the arrow on top of the 1. So that would just simply tell you. So if you look at 21, so 21, the 1 arrow, so you have got more testosterone. So there would be severe virilization. But there is decrease in aldosterone so when there is decrease in aldosterone so what would happen there would be low sodium and high potassium so these child they can present with like you know uh, severe salt losing they might go into shock they usually present with vomiting and uh, they might require some form of uh, glucocorticoid support so the sodium would be low the potassium would be high and there would be high testosterone leading to 
virilization. That is usually the features of 21 hydroxylase, which is the one of the most common cause of congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And 17 hydroxylase, what you see is increase in aldosterone. So what would happen? The sodium would be increased, potassium would be low, and that's why the BP would be raised because the sodium is high. So they would develop hypertension. So they've got like increased BP, but their testosterone levels are fine. So they would not develop ambiguous genitalia. While in 11 hydroxylase, they've got increase in both aldosterone as well as testicular uh, as a testosterone. So they would be having high BP, they would be having high sodium, low potassium, and they would be having increase in testosterone leading to severe viralization. So that's how you can differentiate between 21 hydroxylase, 17 hydroxylase, and 11 hydroxylase clinically. Obviously, you have to do the uh, these particular enzyme levels like you know send by sending the blood into the labs well obviously it's, it's 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 quite expensive certain labs do it but you can get an idea uh, by clinically examining and looking at the clinical feature you might get an idea if that, if that is congenital adrenal hyperplasia which of the enzyme might be missing so the most important is 21 hydroxylase deficiency because that could present with low sodium uh, and high potassium and remember that can cause severe shock uh, usually they present with like uh, vomiting in the neonatal period along with the uh, ambiguous genitalia. They might have to be given uh, fludrocortisone for lifelong fludrocortisone to maintain their sodium levels. And um, uh, in case of any crisis, then they might have to be given hydrocortisone uh, to maintain the uh, sodium levels and uh, maintain the homeostasis. So this was all about... Um, uh, the pathophysiology of the uh, ambiguous genitalia. Now, as far as management is concerned, I told you earlier that don't assign the sex if the if the child presents in the newborn period, because you have to check for any salt losing status and manage it on an emergency basis, especially if you are dealing with uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So that is one thing that would become an emergency. But other than that, you just need to find out the reasons and then you have to discuss it with the family. And while you are doing that, you would take the bloods for microarray and karyotyping to see the uh, proper chromosomal pattern of the child. And you also screen for 17 hydroxy progesterone. You also check for the presence of gonads. And I told you that if the gonads are palpable bilaterally, unilaterally or absent, and then you follow it with ultrasound for presence and type of internal gonads. So later on, these genitalia, once you uh, have found the, the reason, it might require surgical correction along with surgery of internal organs. Like, for example, if it is a being brought up as a female and there are testicular organs inside. So remember, there is always a chance of malignant transformation in the testes. So it's better to remove it uh, earlier rather than wait it because uh, obviously if it undergoes malignant transformation, it can be uh, life threatening as well. Uh, so again, it's it's a very complex issue. It depends on the social cultural beliefs of the family and how the child is raised. It also depends, I told you, on the risk of malignant transformation. So some form of surgery might have to be done if there are internal gonads in the form of testes. Uh, uh, either it uh, it might be done at an earlier stage or it might be done at the uh, later stage. And uh, it takes so many things into consideration. So it's a complex uh, topic. But remember, for clinical practices, if I have to summarize, so any child who's got ambiguous genitalia presents in newborn period, remember, simply check the, ingoin, uh, the labioscrotal swellings for presence of the gonads. If the gonads are palpable on both sides, that's probably testes. Still, you would have, have to do an ultrasound to see what is the state of the internal organs, and you have to do the karyotyping as well. If uh, bilaterally uh, the gonads are um, missing, in the labioscrotal swelling, the differential diagnosis is different. If one is present, one is absent again, then the differential diagnosis is different. But in all these cases, you have to take bloods for karyotyping and screening for 17 hydroxyprogesterone, and then you have to do an ultrasound of the abdomen and the pelvic organs to find what sort of internal gonads are there. You might have to do a few more tests like uh, HCG stimulation test, checking the LH and FSH level, and that would uh, lead to a proper uh, diagnosis. So it could be in the female congenital adrenal hyperplasia. That's one of the most common causes of uh, ambiguous genitalia in a proper unsyndromic female child. Uh, in males, uh, as I told you, it could be uh, different reasons for that. It could be androgen insensitivity syndrome. It could be 5-alpha reductase enzyme deficiency. Uh, it could be gonadal dysgenesis, and or it could be certain types of uh, uh, 
chromosomal problems like line filter syndrome etc etc or if there is dysmorphism there could be like charge syndrome vegar syndrome smith lemley opitz syndrome so on and so forth remember the management is quite uh, complex only in case of congenital adrenal hyperplasia if it is a salt losing status then you have to deal it on an emergency basis and they might need some lifelong um, you know supportive treatment in the form of fludrocortisone and hydrocortisone whenever they are in a crisis for the other things you have to sit down with the family discuss it with them how they want to raise a child and then it might require some form of surgery at a later stage so that was all about um, a simple approach to ambiguous genitalia if you have uh, liked uh, this video then gives me a thumbs up and if you are new here and you haven't subscribed to my channel yet then a subscribe would be fantastic if you've still got any question you can put your question down in the comment section below so have a good day and bye bye